And I'm so excited to stand in front of this sign that says United States Air Trade and Technology Expo and that our community has accomplished this and pulled this off. Uh, there was so much doubt uh, and then there was so much uh, energy and effort. Um, all of the people who volunteered to put this together, uh, what it means for our community and what it means for the industry um, is, is really incredible. Um, you know, I, when we started this, um, there was the discussion that second and third tier suppliers needed a forum to be able to talk about innovation and ingenuity. And I'm just so excited about how this has come off and uh, the numbers that you have had. Um, I, of course, I, I have to thank John McCants again, uh, Deborah Gross, and of course, Mike Imhoff. Um, and the thing that's so incredible about, when you look at the three organizations, the Air Force Association, Dayton Defense, uh, and the Air Show, uh, we're talking about volunteer organizations, from uh, people who took time from their families and their careers to pull this off for our whole community. Uh, to look at how we can move our local economy forward and how we can do something that, that uh, advances our aviation heritage but also celebrates what we currently have in uh, an aerospace industry. Um, and I want to thank Carrie and Rudy also for their efforts to get uh, the congressional portion here and to the uh, ranking member for coming. Um, the, um, and what, what many of you don't know is that when um, is that we had been working on this, uh, the, uh, the chairman chairwoman of our committee, Ellen Tauscher, uh, was going to come uh, to the expo and then she got appointed by the Obama administration to the, uh, to the State Department and with two weeks notice, uh, Buck agreed to come and Buck, I really thank you for being here, uh, now the ranking member uh, on the Republican side for the entire committee. Uh, in such a short time for coming, he had not been to Red Patterson Air Force Base before and I know many of you know that one of my personal goals is to get every member from the Armed Services Committee in and out of here at one point or another because they get to learn um, not just what the Air Force is doing, not just what Red Pat's doing, but that it's all being done in one place, uh, the enormity of the organization of Red Pat. And, and I think it, it gives us a greater understanding of, uh, of really what the Air Force is doing and what our threats are. Um, now, the other thing that I have to add, in addition to Buck having done this at such a short notice and spending the time yesterday at Red Pat and the time he's spending with us today and then uh, onto the air show, um, is that you all may be familiar that there is a health care bill moving through Congress. <laughs> a few of you who have small businesses, if you have large businesses, are aware that there's a health care bill. Um, Buck, um, being on the education workforce, former um, the chairman, former ranking member, um, spent uh, Thursday night, Friday morning in the markup on that bill. It began at 10 a.m. on Thursday and went through 6.15 a.m. on Friday. And yet he got here, flew here, participated in briefings at Red Patterson Air Force Base, and is here today. And uh, you know, Buck, you've got enormous amounts of energy that you've been able to, to do all of that. So we thank you for, for your work. Today. And, and Buck has been a leader on our committee. We're very excited that he's been chosen uh, to be the ranking member. Uh, the ranking member um, who, uh, who started out this year, John McHugh, has been uh, nominated by the Obama administration uh, to be the uh, Secretary of the Army, so the Obama administration continues to rate both the Republican and the Democrat side of, of, of our committee. Uh, yesterday we visited um, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. We got to get a briefing from NASIC. Uh, later after we visit the air show, we're going to, um, to visit with General Hoffman. Uh, and look at material command. And of course, we're going to be seeing the air show today, and we're very excited about the Brazilian Smoke Squadron. We appreciate the Brazilians being here and, and their uh, representation. And I was telling Buck what's great about what we're doing here today and that the, um, uh, what he's getting to see is really the four different groups and organizations. He's going to see Wright Patterson Air Force Base, he's going to see the air show, he's going to see the uh, United States Air Trade and Technology Expo, and he got to see a little bit of the Aviation Hall of Fame last night uh, and that great group and organization and what they do to, to promote aviation. Well, what brings us here today, though, is to talk about the issue of national security, particularly space. Uh, space is critical to modern-day military operations and contributes over $200 billion annual to our economy. Um, as Buck mentioned, our national security relies on our ability to operate in space. But over the past few years, we have seen an increase in threats that could challenge this ability, uh, such as the Chinese anti-satellite test in 2007, and the accidental collision of an Iridium commercial satellite and a dead Russian satellite last February. As Buck was saying, my, my subcommittee that I'm the ranking member on, we have Intel, space, uh, missiles, and, and nuclear programs. My wife describes this, by the way, as four great reasons not to sleep at night. Um, but, um, but the focus on, uh, 
on, on space is really important for us as we look to our capabilities, uh, but also um, our, our industries. And we look at the, uh, the Chinese anti-satellite and the uh, Russian uh, collision that occurred. Uh, these events added thousands of pieces of debris in orbit, presenting a greater risk for further collisions. And moreover, access to space technology is growing, resulting in a greater number of nation states and non-government entities such as universities that are able to put satellites on orbit. According to experts who appeared before the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, uh, these trends are only increasing. Uh, the impacts are significant. Imagine colliding with an object the size of a baseball traveling at 17,000 miles per hour. Uh, such collisions would have devastating impact on our satellites. And early this year, astronauts in the space station had to take shelter in an escape module as a precaution against such a possible event. As many of you know, our capacity to detect, track, and identify these objects in space is called Space Situational Awareness, SSA. Uh, Ground-based radars and telescopes help determine whether an object in space is benign or threatening, and whether two satellites may be on a collision course. SSA tells us what is going on and is essential to our ability to protect our space assets. The House Armed Services Committee took an active role in this area. Uh, we translated our growing concern into bipartisan legislation contained in the 2006 Defense Authorization Bill, which directed the Secretary of Defense to develop a space situational awareness strategy for ensuring our freedom of action in space. We took this as a step in the 2008 Defense Bill by requiring the Secretary of Defense and Director of National Intelligence to develop a comprehensive space protection strategy, a key component which is space situational awareness. We've encouraged the Department of Defense to improve its SSA capabilities, and this year our committee strongly supported the department's budget request of roughly $500 million, a 100% increase over last year's funding level. A large amount of these funds are planned for increasing our capabilities at the Joint Space Operations Centers, uh, led by General James, and can thank you so much for being here. Uh, new sensor development efforts and initiatives that seek to better integrate data, which we already collect. Our committee has also emphasized the importance of working with commercial industries and allies. In the fiscal year 2010 budget passed by the House last month, we included legislation authorizing the establishment of a permanent program to share basic orbital information with commercial and foreign entities to help support collision avoidance. I'm very encouraged by the actions and progress I've seen to date. SSA has enjoyed strong bipartisan support within our committee, and I anticipate that it will continue. The Obama administration recently began a review of our nation's space policy and space posture. The current space policy, signed in 2006 by President Bush, for the first time recognized space as vital to U.S. national interests. Space has become so integral to national security uh, that I'm certainly hopeful that the new administration will put forth and support similar language. SSA and space protection are likely to elicit considerable thought and discussion in these policy and posture reviews. We may perhaps see even more emphasis on international constructs, such as the establishment of international rules of the road to govern space operations. Although there is merit to this concept, especially in encouraging space-faring nations to act responsibly in space, as we don't see as we saw with the Chinese, uh, the debris that is left from, from their test, I do, however, believe that any such concept and its implications must be fully thought through. Our immediate concern that we must look to is that we not disadvantage U.S. space capabilities. It's an honor to be joined by several experts in the Department of Defense who can expand on these issues and discuss SAA uh, programs and plans. In particular, it's really a privilege to have General Larry James here today. The General flew out from California especially to be here for this. Uh, General James, um, I, I want to thank you, and, and Buck McKean keeps saying that I, I keep thanking him, but I really do appreciate all of you participating um, and doing this, and it's great to be able to showcase what's happening here in in the Dayton community as we learn from your expertise on this important issue. I'm also delighted to have uh, on the panel to be joined by one current and one former constituent. John Gass is a senior space intelligence analyst at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. And Colonel Dusty Tyson recently left NASIC and is now leading the Space Control Division at the Pentagon's National Security Space. A robust space intelligence is a prerequisite for space situational awareness and protection. NASIC is essential to this. Our community usually, usually doesn't hear much about them. Uh, much of their work is classified, and they silently and diligently do their job. However, when, uh, what you may not realize is that NASIC is the nation's primary intelligence center for analyzing foreign space and missile capabilities. For example, NASIC 
uh, analysts regularly brief members of Congress, our national leaders, and senior military commanders. We rely on their expertise and analysis to make informed policy and defense decisions. And it, it is interesting to be in Washington and have them travel there and brief us, knowing that they're just a, a stone's throw uh, and, um, and in, uh, in the third congressional district. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, General Mike and Byer uh, for serving as our moderator. Uh, General, you're an American hero, and I appreciate your participation today. Uh, thank you again for our host for this important panel. Um, this is a great uh, weekend for Dayton, both with the Aviation Hall of Fame and celebrating the 40th anniversary uh, with the astronauts uh, to the air show, uh, to the trade show, and of course celebrating right Patterson Air Force Base. And, uh, and I will continue, Bob, until you get on the plane to thank you for being here. So thank you so much.